On this episode of Siesta Key Miami Moves, Amanda and Chloe get their feelings hurt. Jordana gets her BBL, and Lexi gets a big diamond necklace that makes her uncomfortable. I'm Lizzie Frizzle, and this is the Recap Corner, live from my dad's house edition. It's not live. I don't know why I said that. Today, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 2, called You Are in a Huge Pond Now, in reference to Juliet's attempts to set JMP the label apart in the competitive world of Miami swimwear. But first, she's gotta rehash what happened last episode. Juliet meets Lexi at a restaurant where, once again, a server addresses her in Spanish. But unlike last time when Juliet responded in English, now she's speaking Spanish. Hola, ¿cómo están? Hola. Bienvenido. Gracias. Juliet and Lexi rehash the JMP, the label, Miami launch party, which Juliet doesn't think went very well. Lexi asks Juliet why she thinks that, and it's one of my favorite moments from the episode. Because it's like the women from the PR firm Juliet wanted to impress said she made a fool of herself. Why do you think the party went badly, Lexi? Really, though, we're only rehashing Juliet's Miami launch party so she can remind us, again, that Sam paid for her first launch party. And we're only hearing about that so the editors have a reason to clunkily transition to Sam's house, where he and his crew play pool volleyball while his dog watches Kara make out with her boyfriend. Also, Jordana rests upstairs as she recovers from her alleged $25,000 BBL. Earlier in the episode, we watched Sam and Jordana at what appeared to be their first consultation about the BBL, or Big Booty Lift, as Sam incorrectly calls it. There, the surgeon marked on Jordana the areas that would be affected by the surgery, meaning the parts of her body he'll take fat from to then add to her butt. Jordana complimented the surgeon's ability to pinpoint the exact areas she's insecure about. And at the end of the consultation, Jordana goes in for the surgery! Meanwhile, much to Megan's chagrin, Sam doesn't immediately cower at her ultimatum. Instead of making Jordana move out of his Miami mansion and naming Megan his exclusive girlfriend, Sam spends the episode doting on a post-op Jordana. He brings her flowers, plushies, ramen noodles poured from the paper cup into an expensive-looking bowl, all while a very heavy-handed Megan Trainer song plays. Tell me where you seen a booty like this. Don't get distracted when you handle these hairs. Later, Sam's parents visit after picking him up a few things that probably cost more than everything I've ever owned. Also, I'm pretty sure Sam greets his mom by saying Hey, babe. Did I mishear that? What's up? Hello. Hey, babe. Hi. Sam talks to his parents about Megan's ultimatum, about his and Jordana's burgeoning faux fur business, and about how much he likes living with her. During their conversation, Megan is upstairs judging Jordana for letting Sam fund her life. Another of my favorite favorite moments from the episode comes here. Megan reveals to Jordana that Sam didn't want her to meet his parents, so he made her sneak in the back entrance to avoid them. 
Not a great sign for someone who's trying to strong arm Sam into making their relationship more serious. As Sam alienates Megan, Juliet continues to alienate Amanda and Chloe, who were both ready to drop her as a friend entirely. The duo meets up at the popular sugar factory to discuss the situation over fish bowls of alcohol like they drink in that one It's Always Sunny episode. There, Amanda and Chloe go over their growing list of gripes against Juliet. At the top of that list is how she handled Amanda's illness, the one that prevented her from attending the JMP Miami launch party. Amanda says that while she was sick, Chloe texted her every day, but Juliet didn't contact her even once. Honestly, those both seem like extremes to me. Not texting even once is kind of cold and lazy, but texting every day is kind of too much. As Amanda and Chloe rattle off all the things they don't like about Juliet, I realize that a good amount of them are actually things they don't like about Juliet's boyfriend, Clark. They don't like the way he hid in a dark corner at the JMP Miami launch, even though Amanda wasn't even there, and they think he and Juliet fight too much. But Juliet herself has a very different perception of Clark. At the JMP parties, okay. he was like hiding in the dark corners, like avoiding everyone. Wow, healthy. It was good that Clark came to your party. I know, I'm really happy he came. We've gotten in some fights. We never fight, but we fight about this. You know, they fight a lot, and I'm just concerned. This scene and the overall storyline it's contributing to escalate quickly. What starts as Amanda and Chloe worrying that Juliet stopped putting effort into their relationship ends with them agreeing that Juliet needs to be told she's a shitty friend and a shitty person. Juliet is super self-absorbed and she lives in her own world and I feel like as her friends we're obligated to tell her because not only is she a shitty friend, she's a shitty person. Yeah. How did we get here already? It's only episode two. Later, Juliet agrees to meet Amanda and Chloe, but she's late. While they wait, Amanda and Chloe try to predict what excuse Juliet will give when she eventually shows up. They get pretty close. What's the excuse? Sorry, I had to work out. Sorry, I needed to fold my clothes. Sorry, I was waiting for a package to be delivered. Sorry, I had to play with my roommate's cat. Sorry, I just have a lot going on. <laughs> That's my favorite one. <sighs> Sorry, it just took me two hours to get my nails done. Over smoothies that melted because Juliet was so freaking late, Amanda and Chloe confront her about the distance that's existed between them ever since everyone moved to Miami. Juliet bluntly explains that she doesn't have time to worry about rifts with friends, but is also hurt and surprised when Amanda says Juliet is the last person she'd call in an emergency. But like, if Juliet doesn't care that she's growing apart from these people, then why she want them calling her when they need help? Regardless, Juliet quickly decides for everyone, that the conversation is counterproductive, and she leaves within minutes of when she arrived. But it turns out a crumbling social life may be just what Juliet needs for her swimwear line to thrive. The women from the PR firm visit Juliet on set at a JMP The Label photo shoot. Unlike their reaction to the JMP launch party, here the women are very impressed with the quality of the bathing suits, 
with the luxurious mansion where the photo shoot is located and with Juliet's professionalism on set. Juliet invites the PR women to dinner. They accept, and even though Juliet is late to the dinner she arranged, it doesn't deter the PR firm from officially agreeing to represent JMP, the label. But in no uncertain terms, the women explain that JMP is a much smaller brand than what they usually work with, and that if Juliet is serious about elevating her business, she'll need to make major changes, like hiring more diverse models and no longer inviting people who upset her a.k.a. the entire Siesta Key cast, to JMP work events. This scene made me laugh because, seemingly, that's great advice. Don't hang around people that frequently, actively upset you. But in the context of the reality show Siesta Key, it's terrible advice because, like, 80% of the series is built around people getting inexplicably invited places by their enemies. And even when a cast member is invited somewhere by a friend, that doesn't always go well either. Tanir, once again completely isolated from the majority of the cast, invites Brandon to visit her at the studio. There, he meets her manager, Dice, her producer, Sambo Sounds, and other music executives. To ensure that no one forgets his name, and maybe to remind himself a little, too, Brandon wears his biggest BG chain. It doesn't go unnoticed. I can tell your name by the chain, man. Yeah, man, I'm here, bro, you know? I'm the guy looking to see what you got. When Sambo Sounds gives Brandon the opportunity to freestyle rap over a beat, Brandon is cocky about his lyrical abilities. Yeah, I got something for you. Let's you go. got it? If you go in there, make sure you kill it. That's all of I got to say. Say less. Yeah. <laughs> then he gets in the booth. Buckle up, because the footage I'm about to show you is very, very hard to watch. These hoes can't keep their nose clean. I pray the Lord they find peace. But how oh, I done ran out of breath. I'll do four bars at a time. Perfect. Oh yeah, my bad. You was running. My bad. Let's go. Ah. As Brandon bombs in the booth, Tanier's dad and record label founder Ted pays the studio a surprise visit. He asks Brandon about his biggest rap influences. Brandon says himself and Wiz Khalifa. Brandon also tells Ted that he's been rapping for five years, which probably means he only started pursuing a music career after getting cast on Siesta Key. Finally, Ted asks Brandon the most important question. In a field as competitive as the rap industry, what sets Brandon apart? What makes him special? Brandon's response? That he's Brandon. What's going to separate you from all the other artists that's coming out nowadays? A million artists coming out of date now. I feel like what stands me out, man, is I just, uh, and I'm Brandon Gomes. Got it. The funniest part of this whole storyline is that I can't tell if MTV is trying to help or hurt Brandon's rap career. In the past, MTV has played Brandon's music on the show. They've depicted other artists as eager to work with him. And now they've introduced him to a major music executive with real world influence. But through it all, Brandon's never come across as a talented or creative rapper. Don't get me wrong. He's a better rapper than I am. But like, who isn't? 
It's time for the cast wide event. In this episode, everyone gathers to celebrate Lexi's 26th birthday. Lexi's boyfriend, Mike, planned an extravagant party and uses it as an excuse to explain why he's been too busy to spend time with her lately. Lexi's skeptical, even more so after Mike gives her an even more extravagant gift. Oh my God. I'm literally gonna cry. Put it on. Let's see it. With, she's got a stack on. I really don't think I can accept it. You have to. Can I like wear it and see if I like it and then return it? Lexi. At the party, several storylines progress. Starting with the least interesting, after promising his mom earlier in the episode that he wouldn't get distracted by girls, Brandon meets a girl at Lexi's party and immediately gets distracted. Her name is is Christine. She's Kara's friend and the Miss New Jersey first runner-up. I'm guessing producers told Christine that she was cast to play a love interest for Brandon because she comes in hot. She's flirty, she's forward, and because she's a singer, she's very enthusiastic about collabing with Brandon even though any singer worth their salt should probably be enthusiastic about not collabing with him. But Christine just can't resist Brandon's charismatic charm. Damn. It's perfect. You got a flower, I got a flower. We're blossoming. Elsewhere, in the second least interesting storyline, Amanda and Chloe realize that after their smoothie intervention, Juliet unfollowed them both on social media. They start to confront Juliet about it, but she ignores them in favor of a work call. And the girl that I knew, the down-to-earth, sweet, loving girl, she is slipping away day by day. Oh my, I gotta take this. On the phone, the PR women tell Juliet that JMP the label will be featured in their favorite publication, the New York Post. Wait, the New York Post is their favorite magazine? Is there another New York Post? In the third least interesting storyline, Kara complains about Sam and Jordana's frat house lifestyle. When she agreed to live with them for the summer, she didn't anticipate constant partying, drinking, and parades of strangers stopping by to party and drink. Finally, in the least least interesting storyline, Sam stresses about Jordana's well-being after she doesn't answer his phone calls. He leaves her a video message like an absolute maniac, then ditches Lexi's party and Megan, his date, to check on Jordana at home. Realizing that her ultimatum is probably not going to work, Megan searches for other storylines. What she finds is Juliet who wants to apologize for being so mean to her last season. Megan accepts and even offers an insincere apology of her own, but irreversible damage has already been done. The rumor she started about Clark being a bad boyfriend to Juliet has already spread among the cast, and he looks even worse by the end of this episode. Clark does come to Lexi's party, but when it's time to film a scene with Juliet, he storms off. I like this party. Do you like it? <sighs> I, I can't do this. I don't know what to say. I can't do this. Did Clark, like kill a producer's dog or something? For a guy that's barely gotten two minutes of screen time, the editors have already thoroughly vilified him. 
Thanks for watching. Come back next Wednesday for another Siesta Key Miami Moves recap when Juliet will officially declare JMP the label to be her empire, when Lexi and Mike will fight and hopefully break up, and when we'll learn the results of Megan's ultimatum. In the meantime, if you're so inclined, please like and subscribe. Thanks again. See you next Wednesday. Bye. I wish dogs wore pants. I've been saying this for years. <laughs> so you didn't see their butthole. So their asshole doesn't touch everything in sight. When the dog's going to the bathroom, they can't take their pants off. No, you do it. <laughs>